So this topic is going to be looking at organic synthesis and we're going to be focusing on the very last topic pulling together all of our knowledge of all organic topics and that finishes off the A2 chemistry course. So we're going to be looking at how to deduce empirical formula, molecular formula and structural formula using lots of different analysis techniques. So combustion analysis, characteristic reactions of functional groups, spectra, both infrared mass and NMR. We're also going to be looking at how we can increase the length of a carbon chain in a molecule in our synthesis using Grignard reagents. We're going to be looking at specific problems of organic chemistry about how we can predict the properties, we can set up reaction schemes, we can pick select suitable practical procedures and we can also think about the risks or the hazards. So some of the most traditional methods of analysis for any organic compound are finding the empirical formula, then using that to find the molecular formula, identifying the functional groups and spectrometry analysis. Now you have done all of these. Finding the empirical formula was back in topic one of year 12. So was finding the molecular formula, identifying functional groups. So you've been doing that in topics four, five, 10, 15, 18, 19 and now topic 20. So it's taking everything that you've learned from all of these topics and putting them all together. And we've also done spectrometry analysis. We did mass spec in topic two. We came back to mass spec in topic 10. And we also looked at NMR in topic 15 and IR was in topic 10 as well. So just to go back quickly over empirical formula, well, we know that we can find that out by the composition of are the percentage by mass and we've got an example here where we have 40% carbon, 6.67% hydrogen and 53% oxygen and we want to divide all the numbers by their molecular mass in order to get a ratio and divide by the smallest number here and that gives us a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. So we have an empirical formula of C2, CH2O. We can then use that to figure out the molecular formula if we're given the molar mass. So if we're told that the molar mass of this compound is 60, our mass of our empirical formula is 30. So 60 divided by 30 gives us 2, which means we multiply everything in this formula by 2 to give us a molecular formula of C2H4O2. If you can't remember how to do this, have a look back in topic one of AS. There's also plenty of calculations available on the internet for this as well. We've also looked at combustion analysis. Again, we did this back in topic one, and this is the method of burning a known mass of a compound in dry oxygen. We can then use the mass of CO2 to determine the percentage of carbon. We can use the mass of water to determine the percentage of oxygen, so the percentage of hydrogen, and our percentage of oxygen is then done by subtracting our carbon and our hydrogen. And you can see that we have an example here. Again, if you can't remember how to do this, have a look back at topic one. I don't want to spend too much time on things that you've already covered. So we can determine the functional groups that are present in any organic molecule by carrying out small scale test tube reactions. And we, as I said, we've covered these in topics 4, 5, 10, 15, 18 and 19. And these will help us figure out the structural formula of a compound. So what actual structure does it have? So we know that it may have carbons, hydrogens and oxygens, but is it an alcohol, an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid or even an ester? That's what these would do. So I'm not going to go through all of the reactions of the functional groups, but just to kind of briefly summarise them, we've got alkenes because they're going to decolorise our bromine water. We can test for halogenal alkenes using our silver nitrate. Hydroxyl groups can be tested for by adding PCL5 to get our misty fumes. We can also test for primary and secondary alcohol by looking do the oxidize and we can use acidified potassium dichromate or we can use the Tollens reagent to then distinguish between our aldehyde and our ketone. For our carbonyl groups, we use 2,4-D and pH. We get that orange precipitate. We've already discussed for our aldehyde how we can use Tollens or Benedict's. We can also look at our triodomethane test. We can test for carboxylic acids by looking for effervescence and we can test for 
phenol by adding in bromine water and it not only does it keep decolorize but we also get this white precipitate these are all of the reactions that you've been looking at over the last two years you need to make sure that they are all in your head and that you can easily figure out what reagents and what observations that you should have with regards to the analytical techniques, we always use a combination of different spectroscopy techniques to identify organic compounds. And the three that we've covered and that you will be potentially be asked about are mass spec, infrared and NMR. Any scientist would always carry out all three of these on their structure because we want to get as much information as possible. So compound X has the following percentage by mass, and we're told about carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It produces an orange precipitate with 2,4-DNPH, so that tells us it's going to be a carbonyl group there, but it does not react with Tollens or Feelings reagent. We've got our proton NMR that has got one single peak at 2.2 ppm, and that corresponds to six carbons, and we want to be able to determine just the comp the structure of compound x so we're given the mass spectrum we're given the percentage by mass and we're given some chemical tests all we have to do is we have to pull all of this information together so how we do this well we start off by determining the empirical formula and you can see that we get a ratio of three to six to one for our carbons hydrogens and oxygens so we get an empirical formula of C3H6O. The molecular ion peak in our mass spectrum, if we just go back, you can see here is 58. So that means that our compound has to have a molecular mass of 58. Now when we go back to our empirical formula, C3H6O has a mass of 58. So not only is that the empirical formula, it is also the molecular formula. The absorption, if we go back, that we see here in our IR, this is most likely due to our carbonyl group. So we're going to have a carbonyl group within this, and it will either going to be in an aldehyde or in a ketone. So we know that we also have a carbonyl because it reacts with 2,4-DNPH two, to give us that orange precipitate but it does not react with failing solution or with Tollens reagent, so that tells us that it has to be a ketone. There are only one molecule that has got this empirical formula and this molecular formula that is a ketone, and that is going to be propanone. And we can back it up by looking at the proton NMR because it tells us that there are six hydrogen atoms that are all identical, and that is indicating that there are two CH3 groups. So the structure of our compound is as shown here. So we have CH3, CO, CH3. That's simply just taking all of the information that we have been given and just problem solving your way through, taking it step by step to figure out and put the pieces of the puzzle together. There are some examples of this in the textbook if you want to give it a go and you can also find some past papers that will have similar sort of questions. So what does organic synthesis mean? Well, synthesis means to make a new product from something that already exists. So essentially what we're doing, as I've said a few times now, we're going to be collating all of the reactions that we have learned in A-level chemistry, and we're going to form what's known as a multi-step synthesis. And these are going to be limited at A-level to four steps. So that means that you need to be able to plan out how to go from A to B to C to D and potentially to a final product of E by looking at all of the different reactions that we know about. The most important thing that you can do here is have a map of your reactions. And you should have been attempting this over the past year or so, building up all of your knowledge about your organic reactions and you eventually will get a rather large map that will look something a little bit like this. So you can see this is just for our aliphatics, uh, but we've got every single type of molecule that we have looked at. So we have acyl chlorides, amides, aldehydes. We've got Grignard reagents that we're going to talk about in a little bit. We've got alkanes, alkenes, alcohols, and this map shows all of the different ways that we can get in between each of these. I also have a similar map for organic 
uh, aromatic chemistry and the uh, it's also got a little bit about the practical techniques but you can find that in another video but it's how we go from our benzene molecule or phenol to our different reactions So what we're going to look at first of all before we jump into the synthesis is we're going to look at Grignard reagents. So some synthesis reactions require the extension of the carbon chain by one or more carbon atoms. Now we have actually seen how we do this already. We've met a couple of different ways. We can react a halogenoicane with a cyanide ion to form a nitrile. We can add hydrogen cyanide to a carbonyl compound or the alkylation of benzene all of these were able to extend our carbon chain. Now, Grignard reagents are something called organometallic compounds, and they contain magnesium. And these are also another way that we can extend the carbon chain of a compound. And they are formed by reacting a specific halogenal alkane. They tend to be bromoalkanes, but it can be any of them, but we're gonna stick with bromoalkanes. Um, and we react it with magnesium and a solvent of dry ether under reflux. And the magnesium is going to be covalently bonded to the alkyl group. Now, this is something that we've not seen before, and we wouldn't think that magnesium would covalently bond. Now, the good thing is you do not need to know how this happens, but you do need to know that we end up with a reaction like this, where we have the alkyl group, the magnesium, and then the bromine. Once we have these reagents, we can then use them to convert a very large range of organic compounds. There are hours and hours that we could spend talking about Grignard reagents, but we're only going to focus on four reactions. And it is the reactions with carbon dioxide or with a carbonyl in order to make alcohols. And we can make primary, secondary, and tertiary. Now, the good thing is they all follow the same process where we react our chosen reagent, so our Grignard with either our carbon dioxide, methanol, an aldehyde or a ketone, we react that with our Grignard and we then react it with dilute acid to remove the MGBR in order to protonate the um, alcohol or the acid that we're going to make. So let's have a look at an example of how this works. So we're going to start off with a very simple Grignard reagent. Now you do not need to draw the mechanisms for these. However, I'm going to draw a couple of the curly arrows just so that you can see how this happens. But please note that you're not going to be asked to draw the curly arrows in an exam. So we want to react this with methanol. Okay. And what happens is we know that our carbonyl group is going to have this dipole and we get the carbon here attacking this electron deficient carbon and our pi electrons moving on to the oxygen. This then allows us to join this carbonyl group onto our chain giving us a negative oxygen plus our MgBr positive. So of course there is still an attraction between the MgBr and the O, but what we do in order to remove that is we protonate it. We can either use hydrogen ion or we can use water. Okay, so in this case, I'm gonna change this and I'm gonna use water. And what happens is this negative is going to attack into the hydrogen the electrons from here are going to go on to the oxygen and we're going to form an alcohol plus our magnesium bromide is left over and we have this hydroxide. Now you don't need to know very much about this if anything but what happens is these two things actually bond and we make something that looks like this, MgOHBr, and it's known as a basic bromide. This is not going to come up in your exam because we actually don't know a huge amount about this process. This is 
for some scientists, something that they think happens. What we're focused on is this part that we can make the alcohol. Okay, so we attack the electron deficient carbon in our carbonyl group and then we protonate to form the alcohol or the acid just depending on which one it is that we have okay those are the steps that we all we always follow so let's have a look at some of the reactions this first reaction is looking at the formation of a carboxylic acid using a Grignard reagent and carbon dioxide. So our first step is always to form the Grignard reagent. So that's reacting our halogenoalkane with magnesium in the dry ether to form our Grignard. We then react it in this case with CO2. So remember, we are going to have this level of polarity with our electron deficient carbon in the center. That electron deficient carbon is going to be attacked and you can see that it's caused this carbon to bond in here and it is gonna form our molecule with our MGBR attached. So we're gonna then hydrolyze it using a dilute acid, which is a form of protonation and that's then gonna allow us to form our acid with our basic bromide as well. So the other thing that we need to look at is we need to look at the formation of alcohols. So we can form three different types of alcohols. We can form primary, secondary and tertiary. If we form a primary alcohol, it is using methanol as our reagent. So we always have our first step, which is the formation of the Grignard here. And then we have our second step, we have methanol reacting, followed by this protonation, so the reaction either of the with the hydrogen ion or with the water. And basically what we get is we have this hydrogen, this carbon here adding in, and then after we protonate it, we're going to make our, our primary alcohol. When we want to make a secondary alcohol, we would use something like ethanol. And again, step one is the formation of our Grignard reagent. And then we have this reaction happening here. And you can see that we have the ethanol reacting in here and we end up protonating it. And again, we get this secondary alcohol being formed. We don't need to, in order to draw out the mechanisms, remember, it's just simply, can you see what it is that we're going to form? So we've increased our chain length here. We had a chain length of three and here we had a chain length of five. Whereas in the first example, we had the chain length of two going up to a chain length of three. We can also form tertiary alcohols by reacting with something like propanone, which is our ketone. So again, step one, the formation of our Grignard reagent, reacting in with propanone, and then we're gonna form our tertiary alcohol after our protonation. Okay, now Grignard reagents are actually preferred to hydrogen cyanide or potassium cyanide purely because they are safer. We already know the risks of hydrogen cyanide and potassium cyanide with them being particularly toxic. So we want to avoid that, plus they also give a nice wide range of products because we can have any R group on the Grignard reagent. So we can extend our carbon chain by a number of different carbons as opposed to just the one that we would get if we have the cyanide group. So now we can use the functional groups to predict the influence or, or the behaviour of a compound. Um, we can figure out what sort of functional groups are going to cause something to act as nucleophiles or electrophiles, which ones are going to be more susceptible to addition or substitution, or which may be more easily oxidised or more reduced. So if we compare phenylmethanol to 4-methylphenol, we can see that there is a difference here in terms of our functional groups, although they both have hydroxyl groups they are in different places and that is going to have a major effect on the chemical properties. So when we compare the chemical properties well phenylmethanol is soluble and so is 4-methylphenol so not much difference there. The first difference is to do with the pH. The 4-methylphenol is going to form an acidic solution um, but it's not going to form any 
carbon dioxide when it is being reacted with sodium hydroxide, whereas phenylmethanol produces a neutral solution. The phenylmethanol is a primary alcohol, whereas 4-methylphenol obviously is a phenol group. The phenylmethanol is going to form an ester when it's heated with carboxylic acid, whereas the 4-methylphenol does not. And of course, we have that difference in the decolorization of bromine water. We already know from topic 18 that phenol is going to react with bromine water. So we can predict the chemical properties simply by looking at the functional groups. So a typical exam question for this topic is to plan out a reaction scheme and it can be worth up to five marks and it allows us to show all of the intermediate compounds with all of the reagents and all of the conditions and there are three different ways that we can think about a question like this. The first thing that we need to check is uh, has the carbon chain length been changed? If it has we need to see by how many so are we going to use a cyano group or are we going to use a Grignard reagent? And we can either look at the final product and work our way back, or we can look at the starting product and we can work our way forward. So let's have a look at two, two examples. So we want to deduce the reagents and the conditions plus the two intermediates and a three-step synthesis of this compound from benzene. So what we have here is we have got an amide group on our benzene ring. So we know that we're going to have to have some sort of amide being reacted here. And we're having to think about benzene and how we can get from benzene to something that can then be converted into potentially um, an amine and then into an amide group. So you might already be thinking, yes, I know how to do this, but let's, have it. let's start from the beginning. So we're going to start with benzene. And one of the most common reactions that we came across with regards to benzene that's going to help us here is we need to add on a nitrogen. So we're going to be doing a nitration reaction. So for nitration, we know that we're going to need concentrated nitric acid and we're going to need a concentrated sulfuric acid as our catalyst. We're going to heat under reflux and this is carried out at about 55 degrees. And that will give us nitrobenzene. Okay, we then want to think, well, how can we go from nitrobenzene to something to an amide? And hopefully you've worked it out that we now want to go through an amine. So I'm going to need to change the nitrobenzene to an amine. Sorry about that. I ignore that big line. So in order to get to our amine, we're going to have to reduce it and we reduce it using our tin and our concentrated hydrochloric acid and again it is heated under reflux. And then how do we go from the amine to the amide? Well we're going to react it with an acyl chloride at room temperature and that will give us Our reaction here. So we get something that looks like this. We know that we have two intermediates and we have a three-step synthesis. So going from benzene to nitrobenzene to phenylamine in order to make our final product. And you can see there's the answer. So we now want to deduce the reagents and the conditions required for our four-step synthesis this time, so three intermediates, to go from uh, methanol to ethanol. So the first thing that we need to notice is we're getting an increase in our carbon chain and we are increasing it by one. So because we're only increasing it by one, we're not going to use a Grignard reagent for this. We're going to stick with the um, potassium nitrate sorry, the potassium cyanide that we know how to do. So we need to be thinking about how we can convert methanol into ethanol. So the first thing that we need to do before we can actually lengthen the chain length, we cannot lengthen it when it is an alcohol. So we have to start off with CH3OH 
And we need to think about how can we convert that to something that can react with the cyanide. Well, it's going to need to be a halogenal alkene. So we're going to want to chlorinate it. So we're going to chlorinate by adding dry PCL5 at room temperature. And that's going to give us CH3Cl. We can now react that with KCN under reflux. And that's going to give us CH3CN. So now we have our additional carbon that we need. Now we need to think, well, how can we go from a nitrile to an alcohol? We have to go through one more intermediate because we know that we need three. So we can go from a nitrile to a carboxylic acid to CH3COOH by reacting it with hydrochloric acid and again heating it under reflux. And then we can convert the carboxylic acid into ethanol by a reduction reaction, which is LiAlH4 and dry ether. And we do this just at room temp. So that's your four steps to go from methanol to ethanol. So having to convert it into something that can be extended in its chain then extending the chain and then how do we convert the nitrile well we'll almost always go to an acid then back to our alcohol and you can see that we've been given that same answer in our example so as i said previously you may wish to draw a map in order to help you with this process but there are also tables that you can find in the textbook that show you how to convert between the different functional groups and it gives you an equation plus the reagent and the conditions so this is the first table and there is the second table going all the way down to our friedel crafts that we were looking at in topic 18. So as well as everything to do with our reagents, we also have to consider the hazards, the risks and any control measures that we need for any organic synthesis. We always have to make sure that we have safe working practices and we have to minimise any hazards. And that is, doesn't just go for the reactants, it's also with the products that we form and any intermediates. So just a reminder about what a hazard and a risk are. The hazard is the property that could cause harm. The risk is the possible effect that using that substances could cause. But we can also always minimise the risk by using specific control measures. So the most basic control measures obviously are safety goggles, protective gloves. We may need to use a fume cupboard. We may need to make sure that we have um, water nearby if we have to rinse something out. We have to think about if it's flammable, is there any life-threatening toxicity? All of these things will be something that we have to take into account. And of course, we get our hazard symbols on our bottles or on our labels to tell us information. So this label here is an example of some um, what we may see on a substance, just to tell us one what its hazard is and then how we can minimize the risk so if it's oven cleaner for example it can cause severe skin burns and damage to our eyes so we want to be wearing gloves eye protection protective clothing and face protection and of course thoroughly washing our hands if it, we get any in our eyes or any that we swallow or on our skin it tells us how to deal with that and a lot of things will also have a specific um safety data sheet that will come with it that's what SDS stands for so you can find some more information if you need okay let's have a look at an exam past paper question on organic synthesis so we're looking at the June 2019 paper now of course we've got some information in our paragraph here that we're going to want to have a read at you should be scanning the paragraphs before you move on don't just skip right past it because sometimes there is very um, interesting information that can actually help you in your answer. So we have a five mark question where we want to outline a synthesis to go from butan 1 all, sorry, to butan 1 all from 1 bromopropane. 
Notice that the first thing, we are increasing our carbon chain length. So this is actually very similar to the question that we just did as an example, but we've already been given the halogenoalkane. So let's have a look at how we start. Well, we have our one bromopropane, which is a halogenoalkane. So we can directly extend this carbon chain. And how do we do that? Well, we use KCN in ethanolic conditions, and we heat it. And this is a form of a substitution reaction. You don't need to say that, but it's just good in your head for you to, to know that. And we then extend the carbon chain by adding on the CN group. Then we want to convert that into um, our carboxylic acid. As we know that that's going to allow us to then form our alcohol. So how do we do it into the carboxylic acid? Well, we need any strong acid, either hydrochloric or sulfuric, and we heat it under reflux. And we're going to form, in this case, butanoic acid. And then to go to our final answer of butan 1 -ol, well, how do we go from a carboxylic acid to an alcohol, or to specifically to a primary alcohol? Well, we know that we need to undergo a reduction reaction. So we need a reducing agent, and the reducing agent that we always use is LiAlH4 and dry ether. And of course, we react that under reflux as well. Sorry, we react that at room temperature. And that's going to give us our final answer. So the second part is looking to outline a possible method for converting one bromobutane into two bromobutane. So it's not just as easy as just taking the functional group and just shifting it along. We need to actually go through an intermediate in order to do this. So let's start out with what we start with, which is one bromobutane. We know we're going to have to do some sort of reaction in the centre here, and we're going to get our two bromobutane. Now, looking at the marks, you can see that this is only three marks, so it's going to probably only be a three-step synthesis. Can't see, you will not be asked anything bigger than a three-step synthesis for three marks. So how can we go from... Apologies. How can we go from one bromobutane to two bromobutane? Well, the best way to do this is to remove the bromine and then add it back in. So how do we remove the bromine? Well, if we react it with KOH and ethanol and we heat that under reflux, we're going to get an elimination reaction and that removes a hydrogen and a bromine and it's going to leave us with but one in. And we know that we can convert from but one in to our two bromobutane by an addition reaction by adding hydrogen bromide. And we're going to get our two bromobutane being formed. And remember, there is you can if the question went further, it could be talking about the stability of carbocations. We don't need to go into that much detail here. So just to confirm, was our answer correct? Well, the first step was to extend our carbon chain to make the butyl nitrile, then reacting it with the strong acid to get our butanoic acid and then reducing that in order to get our alcohol. So we were absolutely correct. And part B, reacting our 1-bromobutane with our KOH and ethanol to form butuanine, and then reacting that with hydrogen bromide in our addition reaction. 
So those are just two examples of organic synthesis. You can find other questions on past papers or on websites on the internet. I would strongly suggest that you try them and that you practice drawing them out, drawing out all these synthesis. And I would definitely recommend that you draw out an organic map like we saw in this video. They are, can be extremely useful. And the more you learn the map, the easier it is going to be in order to do your synthesis steps. So I hope this video has been useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment and hope to see you back on the channel for future videos.